Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Amir Approved Message. Today I got a special guest, my good buddy Mauricio Del Mauricio Di Bartolomeu. That's it. Exactly. He is the co-founder and chief strategy officer of Ledin, a financial service company built for Bitcoin and digital assets. Mauricio has been involved in the Bitcoin space since 2014. When in Venezuela, he learned that friends were using it to earn income by mining and protecting their wealth by converting it into censorship resistant currency. Now residing in Canada, he's been working on Bitcoin full time since then, developing technology to make it easier to hold and use. Mauricio, welcome to the show, my friend. Thanks for having me, man. Always a pleasure to be here. Likewise, man. So I want to start off with your story in Venezuela. Take us through, you know, first of all, how did you get involved in Bitcoin within Venezuela? And then how did you end up in Canada? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. So I guess I'll start by saying how I ended up in Canada first, because that happened before I got into Bitcoin. Uh, in uh, 2003, I graduated high school in Venezuela. So Venezuela had um, uh, essentially here in Canada, you do grade 12. And at the time, you also had to do grade 13. Uh, but oh, they had that too. Yeah. Same here. Yeah, yeah. So in Venezuela, well, actually, that's, that was what was happening in Canada when I came. Uh, in Venezuela, you graduated after grade 11. Okay. So uh, in, uh, after you graduated grade 11, I, I really wanted to study abroad. Chavez, uh, you know, had been ruling the country for a few years then. Um, my family and I had done a couple of years in Florida. Uh, basically, we went right after Chavez won the election mm -hmm. because a lot of Venezuelans took the view that this was going to be like, oh, just like a passing through president. Let's just get out of the country for a few years, see what happens. Um, so we spent a few years in, in, in Miami, actually, and uh, where, where a lot of Venezuelans went. And uh, two years went by. My dad kind of my family didn't really feel at home there. Uh, and my parent was having a hard time managing his business remotely in Venezuela. So we left. We went back after two years, kind of hoping that the thing would fade away very quickly after. But I had a different view, and I still was very much excited and, and uh, really loved the idea of studying abroad. So I had had a really good time in Florida. I really wanted to stay outside of Venezuela. And um, I, my father at the time didn't really want to send me to back to Florida to live with myself and do school. But I did have a relative here in Toronto. And um, I was sent here to kind of explore options, uh, somewhat reluctantly, because <laughs> I, I really wanted to go to the US. But uh, I came to Canada and um, kind of serendipitously while here, it was actually in late September that I came here. Um, and while here, I started going to universities because I was applying for university. And they said, oh, forget it. Like this is a double cohort year. You, we're graduating. We're, we're basically winding down grade 13. So this year there's twice as many people fighting for spots in universities. So I would honestly forget it if I were you. This is what I was told uh, by the universities. I went to basically almost all of them uh, in Ontario. And uh, I was essentially told that there was no chance, forget it. Like, what do you, you know? Uh, the best thing you can do is go to a public school in Venezuela and transfer after one year, mm. which was, uh, you know, if any Venezuelan is listening, like, you know, that's not, a, that's a, no, it's a non-starter. So I was like, okay, great. I guess I'm just going back home. And as I was getting ready to pack my bags, um, there was a riot that broke out and it was a big one. And I forget exactly which one it was, but it was like late September um, 2002. And um, actually, I think it was right in the middle of the, the, big, um, the big oil. There was a big shutdown, a big government shutdown or a big countrywide shutdown of the main oil company right around that time. I actually think that's what it was. And it looked really bad. Like the whole country was at a standstill. It, it looked like st stuff was just starting to go down. And my family was very much like, you're not coming back. Like you, no matter what you have to do, whatever, I don't care that you don't like the schools. I don't care that you don't want to do grade 12. You can't come back. And I was like, ah, like, you know, I was really frustrated. I was like, screw this. I'm not going back. I'm not staying. And I woke up the next morning and I had a list from uh, my aunt who had, who I was staying with, with a, a list of five schools, high, high schools for me to check. I was very disappointed because I was like in my head, I was like, I'm going to university, right? And now I'm having back to like these high schools. So like very much like in a movie, I like, you know, crumpled up the paper ball and I go to the window and I throw out the, the ball and I look out and right in front of me, there's a building that says high school. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then I was like, okay, like, I guess things are just like, like something wants me to stay here. Mm. So I cross the street, um, I'll, I'll say the name because they were very kind to me, it's the York School here in Toronto. Uh, and I crossed the street and I basically t told him my spiel. Uh, I was, the school year had already started. Um, 
and uh, I didn't really bring much. I just had my laptop and like, you know, a small suitcase. Not that I would need anything, mm -hmm. but they were super kind. And they were just like, stay in here. And then from that moment on, that's when I am in Canada. Uh, so I, that, I, then I did my grade 12. Uh, from there, I applied to Western and uh, I did my undergrad at Western, which is where I met Adam, the co-founder of Ledin. Uh, made really great friends. And that's kind of how my journey in Canada started. Now, as this all was happening, uh, now we get into the Bitcoin part. That's, mm -hmm. that's how I came into Canada. Uh, as this all was happening, my family, again, was still back home. So I was the, the, the only one in my family who actually went away to school. Uh, so I would go back every summer. I would spend back every Christmas. I would spend back. Um, when I graduated, I did um, a few years here, but then I went back to do a couple projects with my family. My family was very much always trying to get me to come back and, and you know, build their business there. They're very entrepreneurial. So um, obviously it was always a give and take because Venezuela was, you know, oil would rally, things would do well, oil would crash, Chavez would do some bad things. And it was just very much, very volatile. Like, um, so in, uh, let's see. So right now I, I finished my undergrad. I stayed here at around 20, 2013, uh, which is when Chavez dies. Venezuela hits like a almost like rock bottom, uh, right? When when Chavez dies, they call for a new election. Everybody gets very excited that this is going to be the end of Chavismo and that the country is finally going to turn the page. Um, I was very excited at the election, along with many people uh, around me. But the government, so essentially, we lost that election. The government, we didn't lose it. The government stole it again. Um, and when that happened, that that. Uh, that, in, that was the event in 2013 that kind of kicked off this massive exodus because up until then there was still like, you know, some sort of people were still hanging on to this idea of change that might happen. Mm. But when Chavez is gone and then these guys stuck around, people were like, okay, like this, maybe this isn't just like a Chavez thing. Maybe this is like a structural issue. And I, at that point, made the decision that I was going to stay for the foreseeable future in Canada. Up until then, I was always debating, should I go back? Should I this? Should I that? When that happened, I was like, okay, turn the page, you know, write this off for a few years, like try to convince your family to leave. And that was kind of my tune. I would always go back, trying to get them to leave. But my, my brothers were in a completely opposite camp. They wanted to make things work in Venezuela no matter what. And... My father being an entrepreneur, he always wanted us to have our own kind of ventures and they, he would help us, the brothers kind of pitch and he was a bit of an angel investor for all of us. Mm -hmm. and we would pitch ideas and he would you know, ask us questions and he would write a check at the end if he liked it. Um, so I started, he started asking me to kind of help him uh, review my brothers, uh, my youngest brother, who had just graduated at the time, business opportunities. Everything was like, you know, no, too, too risky, politically associated with the country, forget it, forget it, forget it, until he basically puts forward this idea of buying Bitcoin mining computers. Uh, and this was in the summer of 2014. And I, that was my first, first time I got exposed to Bitcoin. Uh, when I saw it, I thought it was interesting. I learned what a miner was. I kind of over high level learned what Bitcoin was and, and what a miner, how a miner fit into that equation. So I thought, so I saw the economics. I saw, the, I saw there was a bit of a trading market for Bitcoin. Um, and, um, uh, and I said, sure, like this, out of all this stuff that you've tried. And I also like that the economics are very compelling. Venezuela has essentially free hydro and, and electricity was a main, one of the main costs for mining Bitcoin. So I was like, you know, if nothing else, give this a shot. And that was summer 2014, uh, Christmas 2014. I went back, my brother's like smiles <laughs> ear to ear <laughs> and, uh, has got like three times as many computers. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, oh, I didn't even ask him anything at the time because I was like, even that, even when I saw that, how quickly the growth had been, I was like, okay, something's up. Like, this doesn't add up. So I went and talked to my dad. I was like, dad, you, what happened? Like, did, are you not looking? Did you just write him another check? Like, what? Did, I saw, I see a lot more stuff now. And he was like, no, go talk to him. Those are all his machines he paid me back. And at that, that, so that was a moment where I was like, okay. Like I missed something huge. Mm. So I went and talked to him. He explained it to me. He showed me how much the machines were making, what they cost, what, you know, how, what the price of Bitcoin had been in that last bit. Yeah. And I was just, that was like my aha moment where he, I saw him sell Bitcoin, get deposited straight into his bank account. And, uh, and at that point I was like, okay, I, I, I couldn't even think about anything else other than Bitcoin. And, caught and the so bug. I caught the bug from that moment on. I essentially went down the rabbit hole 
uh, got really deep into Bitcoin and a couple of other coins that were at the time. I just wanted to learn about the technology. I, I did go through a learning process and I'm not opposed to any of the other stuff. I'm just kind of sharing. And what were you guys, you guys weren't using, you were using ASICs back then? We or? were using ASICs. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, it was ASICs at the time. Um, I believe they were as fives or as sevens. I can't okay. remember. Um, but yeah, and so that was kind of where I started my learning journey. And um, they, I was in Canada still back and forth. So I, I thought that mining was this thing that was, you know, an opportunity that was only reserved for Venezuelans mm. or, or, you know, and, and I was almost very frustrated that, you know, they were able to monetize this, this beautiful new asset that I, that we had all learned about, yeah. but I was sitting here in Canada, you know, unable to kind of monetize or participate. And so I was like, okay, well, the first thing I can do is just start to try mining back home. And so, you know, I started mining with some of their machines. Then I started helping other people, not some of the machines, bought my machines, play, place them with theirs. And then I started, then they started helping a lot more people mine because then the, over there, it starts going quite viral. So throughout this learning experience of essentially, um, well, maybe I, now I've jumped across of how I got into Bitcoin. Yeah. But then that what, what helping a lot of these people build mining businesses and seeing everyone around me building Bitcoin businesses may expose me to the next biggest pain point in the, in the Bitcoin space as far as I saw it, which was that we were all looking to make Bitcoin and it was great and accumulate as much as we could. But to grow the businesses, we had to sell it. That was really the only yeah, you needed way cash flow. you needed cash flow yeah. to keep growing the business. But the cash flow, your cash flow was your Bitcoin and selling that Bitcoin carried a very high opportunity cost. Like every time you sold it, if you sold it at the wrong time, like, oh man, that was a costly mistake, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And so I started thinking about ways uh, on how you could help Bitcoin businesses maintain that Bitcoin balance while giving them that cash flow. Mm. And that's essentially how this, the genesis for let in, like the Bitcoin back loan idea came to be. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that I kind of took you through a, a, a three stories there, but that's, that's essentially how I, I built a lot of my thesis around Bitcoin. And so tell me the story, like, when was it that you realized it was too, because right now it's a different landscape in Venezuela. Like, when did you realize it was kind of too unsafe or you couldn't continue doing business as you were doing usually down there? Ah, that's a great question, man. Um, um, the hard part about being in those systems is that it's a bit like, you know, frog in water, yeah. right? Like you, you just get so desensitized to certain things. So for example, uh, when I was young in Venezuela growing up, like this is when I was like 14 or 15, I distinctly remember my parents would give me a rate, like a radius, an area of the city where mm -hmm. it was safe to be. And it was a significantly, you know, it was a, obviously it wasn't a huge area. I'm not from a big city, but in context, like it was, I would say like call it, 25 to 30 percent of the city as as far as i knew it mm -hmm. so this is like just these are your boundaries right um as you get older like those boundaries become smaller and smaller the times that you can be out become smaller and smaller and the things that happen to people around you the stories build up it's like oh so and so oh he got robbed at 3 p.m on this street yeah and like oh wow and then so and so got shot at you know 11 p.m on that side of the street and you're like wow but then, and so as, as these things start encroaching on your environment and as the hours become smaller and smaller, you start finding justifications for things. Mm. So for example, uh, we used to love going to the beach. The beach is a two hour drive from my hometown. Normally, you would, when I was growing up, you could drive to the beach at like 6 p.m. and like arrive by 10. And like, you would still hear one or two people being like, oh yeah, like, you know, we'll, we'll drive straight to the beach after the bar, like we'll have a DD. A lot of times not, and people would just get out of the, and then literally at two, three in the morning, you would drive to the beach. And this was like, I'm talking way back in the heyday. And you would have, you would see people like on the streets and stuff. Now it's like almost a death sentence to get in a car when it's not lit up outside mm. it's because there are no street lights. So all of a sudden you were hearing, I was hearing stories about my friends, people that I knew getting robbed or shot on their way back from the beach at like 9 p.m. But then what you hear is not, oh my God, our roads are becoming so dangerous. No, the narrative becomes, what's that guy doing at 9 p.m. driving? He's lucky that they didn't shoot him. 
becomes part of everyday life. And you're just like, yeah. and then as I'm looking at these things, I'm like, and to me, I guess the, the what made it harder for me was because I wasn't the frog that was always in the pot because I was spending a lot of the year in Canada. You're outside, yeah. I would come back. And so, for example, I, I, I even remember this. I distinctly remember, you know, I would make a list of the things that I wanted to do. And, uh, and you know, in Venezuela, getting things done, is, I know it sounds trivial here, mm -hmm. but like in Venezuela, everything's presence-based still. Like phones don't work, emails don't work. You have to go. Face-to-face. -face. Do the things. Yeah. Sometimes it'll take you a whole day to get through like one bank errand. And I would, I would distinctly, I know I would go in and I was like trying to get all my stuff in order and get, do all my list. And like, I would only get two or three things done and I would get frustrated. Mm. And I would see my family were like, why are you frustrated? <laughs> and I was like, well, because I only was able to do one thing out of yeah. the 10. And they're like, the, you can't like, this isn't, you know, you're going to have a very hard time if you stay here with those expectations. You have to change your expectations to like the things that can be done. And I was like. Well, if I do that, then, but, but it was very hard because, you know, on one side, you have that, like you just continues, to, your, your life continues to like the things you can accomplish just become lower and lower. But at the same time, you have this like underlying comfort that is 30 degrees all year round and the beach is always around. But then when did you, you and your brother realize like, no bueno, no more, you know? So that, that well, that was actually a pretty easy one uh, because like I said, to you, my, my mind had been somewhat made up from the beginning, but my family was still a bit reluctant to say, hey, this is too much. So um, they, were, we were, they were all doing great and growing their mining operations uh, until December 2017. Uh, December 2017 was the day uh, the... So well, this is five years running mining operations. Uh, pretty much. Pretty much. Yeah, yeah pretty okay. much. Like, the, mind you, the big growth happened. Like, the first year was very experimental. Sure, The sure. second year, like, the bigger, the big growth years were, I would, I want to say, um, 2016 and 2017. Okay. Like those were years. But roughly where, speaking, within the industry, five years, two years of growth. So now, 2017, what happens? So, okay. So, in, 2000, in 2016, we start, in 2016 and 2017, it was, it was more and more people setting up machines and, and wanting every time more and more help, setting up bigger and bigger facilities. Mm -hmm. Uh, we had at that point now become known as like the guys that would help you out, right? And so that was very rare because no one in the space would actually was willing to help you. Mm. We were very different in that. We just wanted to share. We thought this was amazing and we wanted to help people out. Um, and, um, and so, you know, at the end of 2017, Venezuela with this whole Petro effort, which we can get into in all sorts of detail because... You know, there's a perception outside of Venezuela of what the Petro was, but that's not the at Petro all. coin. Yeah, the oh, yeah. Petro, Venezuelan Petro. Uh, so the Petro was essentially a, a big organized campaign or a, a way for Maduro to tell his cronies what a mining machine was, and essentially that they could go and take them mm. and change the wallet address, and that no one would know, and essentially letting them know that they could go extort the new entrepreneurs. Right, because the the everyone that had an import export business, farms, everyone had become a miner. Like there was just no private business happening outside of mining. So the government was like, okay, well, we need to keep our crooks happy. Usually they do that by sending them to uh, industries or whatever, and and asking or demanding for ridiculous things, and sure. so they'll get payouts and, and bribes in many ways. So they needed a company that was willing to pay out bribes, right? And like every time there's fewer and fewer because they're decimating all of them. So uh, in the absence of any company to send them to get, get bribes, they said, okay, well, let's teach them <laughs> what these machines are, how much they make and where they can find them and how they can find them. And it's quite simple and they'll go and grab them all, right? And they'll just extort up dollars. And if not, they'll just take the machines. It's going to be beautiful. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's actually what happened. So, so you had a knock on the door? Oh, yeah. And myself and many, and like many, many. Yeah, I can share a list of friends that had the same happen. So what did it go down? Were they pretty blunt with you? It was like pay up? Yeah, pretty basically uh, 15K and your computers or you're going to jail. Mm. And uh, and then obviously the response was like, okay, why? Like we don't break it. We didn't break any law. Like here's my import records. Here's all the hydro I paid. Like here's my internet bills. Like what about this is illegal? And they're like, no. But it's funny because at the time they had... They had the backdrop of the Petro, which is we're making everything legal. Everyone can mine. Venezuela is going to become a tech, blah, 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 blah. But on the other side, you had, no, you're, it's illegal. You need to pay up or else. 
And so it was funny because it was a, it was an interesting conversation back and forth because it was like, well, A, you're saying this morning you said it was legal. Here's the registry. I'm, I'm offering you to give you these mm -hmm. things, but you're telling me that it's illegal. Essentially, like you just want my machines. So like a lot of people that knew kind of how what what the levers were and, and you know, they, what they could claim as their rights. Mm -hmm. uh, some people still were under the impression that you had those in Venezuela. Um, you know, there's some pushback, right? Because we weren't, we didn't consider ourselves criminals, right? My brother, neither, none of us, but they were punctually, they were after my brother at the time. So we essentially took a very hard stance. It's just said, no, we're not breaking any laws. Like we're willing to go, go to court if you want. Like, you know, let's, let's do this. Let's dance. Because we're not like, we'll win. Uh, that's not, that was actually like very rare. Most people just paid up and shut up. Uh, and there's, they still do today. Uh, but so my brother, in my brother's case, um, they, you know, they, 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 it, it upset them that we weren't just willing to write a check. Yeah. Uh, and they started threatening us with like, you know, they telling my brother they knew where he lived and where the kids went to school and all this stuff, stuff that cops <laughs> should never be telling you, right? Um, so my brother is like, at this point, I remember my brother was the only Because yeah, these are federales. Yeah, yeah, these are the feds. Yeah. So um, my brother was alone in Venezuela. At the time, my bro my my dad was out of the country. My other brother was out. I was out, so it was scary. Mm. Um, so he he was scared. He was like, you never thought that the next thing they would say after you said no, I want to actually like go through the due process. It was like there is no due process. Like you're in jail. <laughs> so that was like the last thing anyone expected. So after they went like full like you no know, El Chapo like Escobar like yeah. what, the second we realized that these guys aren't these guys are just criminals, straight criminal thugs. So yeah. my brother made the call to leave the country overnight. He drove to the border uh, with him and a couple of friends that didn't, you know, were look kind enough to do a convoy. Like I said, you don't drive at night in Venezuela. Mm. So if you do, you drive with like a convoy and guns, strap, and fuel, bro. and fucking like be strapped everything. To the yeah. Nine, yeah. So uh, they he drove on a convoy with a bunch of cash. Was able to get through to Colombia. Um, he f we fought the case legally from abroad. Essentially, he's now been fully part. Like there's, oh, the case good. has been dismissed. Okay. He's been given a full kind of reinstatement of you know no laws were broken, uh, so he's free to go in and out. Uh, he still hasn't gone back. Uh, my my youngest and my dad they still go back and forth like in and out uh, once in a while, but uh, I think to me personally speaking, it was a bit of a blessing in disguise because my my family needed to be shocked. Uh, in order to be t taken out, uh, because it's a very hard decision to make. To, man, to yeah, leaving your old culture, your family, friends, way yeah. of life. I and, hear you, and, man. you know, and you know, frankly, like they still think of going back. This, no matter, you know, even after all of these things. It's funny you bring that up. I asked my mom. She's former Yugosla former Yugoslavia, and sometimes she tells me it's like even even with the wars and all that. Sometimes I think I should have stayed. I, I think I, I sometimes I think I should have stayed. Yeah. I, I, people ask me all the time, like, you know, the question you just asked me, like, when did you decide it was enough? And then the other one that I get a lot of times is like, do you think it was the right move? Yeah. That breaks me, man. That fucking question breaks me. Yeah. Uh, because you never know. Like, how could I ever know? And great. I'm doing a lot of here things, a lot of good things now. But like, if I had stayed back there and I'm again, I'm going a bit on a limp here. But like if you had stayed in a place like Venezuela or if your mom had stayed in a place like Yugoslavia, your mind sometimes, you know, you, you can't shut it down. A lot of times you read about something terrible that's happening in Venezuela and mm -hmm. something that perhaps it was very close to you where you could have done something about it, mm -hmm. but no one did. And like people died and you hear like really, really shitty stories. And <laughs> quite frankly, man, like, Sometimes I think here to myself that I'm here fighting to make the world more efficient and more amazing for a lot of people that already have a very efficient, very amazing world. Mm -hmm. And I can't help but think that perhaps what I do today compared to what I could be doing is selfish because there are people that are literally starving and their lives could be materially improved if they just learn basic English, right? But no one's doing that there. People are here trying to set up Fortune 500 companies and go public. 
So the question then is, how do you create initiatives to actually fix things that make a difference? Right, for example, you, the example right now you gave us about English. Let's say you and I have $3 million to deploy for this. You know, we'll get it down there. How do we start? So <laughs> now that's the thing, you know, people, there's cognitive dissonance. Like I want to change and this and I'm like, okay, let's talk, let's talk facts. Like what can we actually do well, that's you, realistic that we can start? If you want to open up a very like galaxy brain conversation about the shortcomings of Bitcoin as a solution. Yeah. Which I, well, there are a lot of shortcomings. So you know? I'll, 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 you know, to expand a little bit on the Venezuelan subject. Venezuela has become a poster child for Bitcoin use across the world. Yeah. Right? Arguably. Um, what is it? Six months ago, February, we had every top media personality, every billionaire, anyone that's anyone in the world of show business was about Venezuela. Mm -hmm. Concerts at the border, like every every celebrity was down there playing, efforts, Trump, the whole world was there trying to open up that border and get that food in. Remember? I think we even had a chat about actually, it. Actually, we talked about this. Yeah, I remember. Okay. What has changed since then? Probably nothing. Like most movements or anything. A lot of times it's for optics and for politics and to get fucking votes. And so now, again, here's another issue that I have, right? Like... And, and this is why I'm so, the, the, the result of all of this, you know, uh, frustration is what's, what's pushed me to dedicate all of my resources to Bitcoin because I feel that it's, so my, my frustration is that I can teach Venezuelans all I can about Bitcoin and I can do my best and get everyone on board at the Bitcoin and away from the Bolivar and all this stuff. At best, at best medium or short term that just allows someone to escape mm -hmm. at best at best yeah right um best case scenario right if a large number of people do this right and they escape what's the net result of that and how is that different from what's been happening so in, in essence sorry just maybe to, to get to the end i think bitcoin accelerates something that's already happening in this world, which is that whenever anyone in a, in a non-free country gets a windfall payment, the first thing they do is they become free. Mm -hmm. First by sending their money away, then slowly they start sending their families uh, in an absence of being able to send themselves. Like for example, a Chinese business person that makes a million bucks, first thing they'll do is buy a condo in Vancouver, or Toronto. Of course. Next thing they'll do is they'll send all their children to university in Canada to get passports here. Can't blame them. No. Fuck, I'll do the same thing. Everyone <laughs> will do the same thing. Of course. Anyone outside of the OECD countries looking to get in. Yeah. That's safety, man. That's it. Freedom and safety. Yeah. So perfect. So okay, let's let's play this out. I'm escaping my capital. I'm escaping my people. This is great because mm -hmm. on the surface more people are becoming free, right? The flip side of that is that Venezuela right now has become a swamp of corruption, despair, and absolutely zero moral values. Because mm -hmm. anyone with some values made money and left. Yeah. If we, the free, now reconvened people, only care about helping more of us come here and not and not about what's really being left behind at some point that's gonna break right like at some point that that balance should create some sort of compromise in that there'll be more people that are unfree and willing to lose more because that's the other the, the other flip side of the argument is that when you're rich and you're free you have way too much to lose to go into a fight. Of course. Way too much. But when you're not rich and when you're not free, sign me up. So do you see how that, that scares me a little bit? Yeah, but you got to look at history too. For example, revolutions don't work. They work temporarily. Like a good example of revolutions that's been happening nonstop is Latin America and precisely Cuba. Every like 15 to 20 years is a revolution in Cuba. 
it's a multitude, multi-variable factor when it comes to even Venezuela, because it's not just in Venezuela. You have geopolitics. The United States is involved. Russia's involved. Right. China's involved. You have all these big geo powerhouses involved. It's a different story when you're talking about just the United States. It has one of you know, the biggest navy in the world, the nukes, right? Mm-hmm. You know. But when you're talking about pick any country in Latin America or pick any country in the Middle East, whatever, it's not just them. You have all these other players involved, and each of them has their own incentive to be there for specific reasons. Mm-hmm. Obviously, resource protection, resource gathering, bottom line. Mm-hmm. Collateral damage is citizens of that country. That's the reality, no matter where you go. And then you go into the debate, the moral, ethical debate. What do you do? You know, it's tough to say to somebody, "Hey, man, like I'm going to stay here for you know fight," but you have a daughter who's six years old. Like I'm getting the fuck out of here. Mm-hmm. Gonzo. 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 Most people are. I'm not even going to think about it. I'm but most gone. people are. I, I think like you know, conflict or war as we know it is gone. Like no country right now has the the. I don't know, the democratic support to go... Like, it's politics. It's hard to sell. Yeah, it's very hard to it's sell. It's hard to sell. It doesn't mean it's not going to happen. Like, I am a little bit scared right now. Like, Eric Weinstein talks about this, too. And it's, um, we've, we've had, especially in the West, so Western Europe, uh, North America, uh, we've had, for the first time ever in history, the longest stretch of peace. Like world, like okay, Korea War, World War Two, World War One. We have a gener, we have a, now a generation, um, you know, since like the '80s till now that's never experienced any conflict. Well, but with peace, you know, there's always a flip side to peace. You have this kinetic energy that builds up, this boiling pot, political boiling pot. You can see in the states now, like polarization, left versus right, like they're like this mm-hmm. apart, you know, fighting and bickering each other. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't want to be cynical, but I think everything's cyclic in life. Mm-hmm. And I think things eventually will pop off somewhere, last for a little bit, calm down. You know, like all good empires, empires fall. You know, the question, the question, what do you do? It's like, it's a big moral ethical question. I'm a, uh, at least for me, it's like, I want to protect me and my family. Yeah, no, I'm Bread on the table, shelter. Once I'm taken care of, me and mm-hmm. my family, I can then take care of other people. You know, there's a good Rumi saying, yesterday I was clever, I wanted to change the world. Today I'm wise, I want to change myself. Right. If I'm not taken care of, if I don't have shelter over my head and food on the table and safety, how the fuck am I going to help somebody else? I, I'm with you. I'm with you. I, you know, frankly, to, be, you know, to bring it back to Bitcoin, like, I, I, am, I love with the idea of what Bitcoin is like, because I've, you know, it's. So what's the current landscape right now in 19, 2019 in Venezuela and crypto and Bitcoin primarily? Yeah. So Venezuela, the current state, the whole country is dollarized. Uh, everything is in dollars. Everything's USD. From a yeah. carrot to a pack of smokes, to a water bottle, to a car, you'll get quoted or to a taxi ride. Everything's quoted in USD. So how does it work? You get paid in boulevards and then people are flipping it right away. Yes. It's a hot potato. It's uh. a, it's a, almost like a hot potato with a big dash dynamite because <laughs> it explodes in your hands. Um, so essentially it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's been reduced to, uh, you know, the, the absolute bare minimum requirements, which is obviously the government being the government, like they, the only things that the only thing they accept essentially is Bolivares. So like for a lot of other social programs, like they only pay out Bolivares as part of their, um, what do you call it? Um, pension plans are paid in bolivares. Like it's it's always for the biggest loser. Essentially, mm-hmm. is the ones that gets the bolivares. Um, practically speaking, like from a day to day Venezuela, no one wants them. No one touches them. Like it's the last thing people want to carry. Um, Bitcoin, it's still uh, you know dollars are everywhere. People carry them there. There's almost like a market if your bill has like a, a lines on it or not, or like little writings, things on it. Like a lot of people have, um, what do you call it? Uh, you know, those bill things that where you can see if they're uh, uh, forged or not. Like they, they have like these little pens that they draw on or even the lamps. that. They oh, yeah. The under. UV lights. And like yeah, all yeah, yeah. everywhere, man. Yeah, like yeah. everyone has like a Make 4X. sure it's not counterfeit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everyone has like a Forex stand yeah, on yeah. their business. Uh, a lot of things are dollarized. So like a common challenge would be, uh, for example, oh, I only accept dollars, but I don't give change in dollars. 
Mm. And so then there's little things like that where well, where people get frustrated. Like, what do you mean? Like, I, here's your dollars, but you're, I need dollars back. And yeah. Like, no, I only pay you this. And so it's almost like every shop that's still there, largely their reaction, their interaction feels like they're doing you a favor as a consumer, right? Like the consumer, like this whole thing about the consumer's always right doesn't yeah. apply to it. <laughs> that's only like American thing. Yeah. It's like <laughs> over there, it's like the guy with inventory is always right? yeah, I mean, <laughs> like, like, it's like you want the inventory, you pay what it costs. Yeah. Uh, so largely it's, it's mostly dollarized. Uh, there is increasing use of Bitcoin for, I want to say general things. Um, okay. so there's, um, companies now that are putting points of sale for crypto in their biggest kind of uh, chains in the country. So like the big pharmacy announced that there's now some of their locations are starting to take uh, crypto payments. Uh, kind of a neat feature, actually, by uh, our friend, uh, a good friend of mine, Jorge, and he, he runs a company called CryptoBuyer, and he's doing point-of-sale systems where people from abroad can prepay for medicine in the pharmacy and have someone in Venezuela go pick it up. Ah, uh, that's pretty cool. So it's great for everyone because a lot of people, a lot of guys like myself or people that have left just have older relatives back home that they all need medicine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're sending them money for them to get it, so it's almost e it's actually a really helpful uh, if you can do these things. And uh, another interesting development that I had from another friend in Cucuta, called Cucuta is that, that Colombian town right next to Venezuela where all the concert was. Mm -hmm. Cucuta now has the first two Bitcoin ATMs uh, and they're actually right as you finish crossing the bridge. So they probably have like five guards there with fucking AKs. Do you know how many people cross that bridge every day? No idea. 50,000 people. Wow. Holy shit. Yeah. And, um, and ev every day. Like wow. not like one day, 50, that like it's every crazy. day is a sea of people. Uh, and, uh, and an interesting chat. So now we've been, uh, we've been expanding to Colombia, Venezuela and a bunch of other markets. And I've been talking to a lot of people there. Uh, and uh, one of the very cool things that I heard was that people are using the ATM. Mm. Uh, people are going across the border, taking out a piece of paper with 24 words and figuring out that they can withdraw in Colombia. And they're not they're not crossing with gold or dollars, which gets taken nine times out of ten. Of course, man. So these people are actually now crossing with these words, and they're taking out you know forty sixty dollars worth of pesos from this ATM, uh, and they're taking their groceries for the day and going back. Venezuela, a lot of Venezuelans go to go to, go to Colombia for groceries and and medicine mm. for every day. Mm. There are Venezuelan people that send their kids to Colombian schools um, mm. and make them cross every morning. So and it's becoming you know, more and more a thing to do. So the fact that this is, you know, percolating to the people that are crossing the borders on foot, like Bitcoin started at the very top. Like when I first heard about Bitcoin in Venezuela, it was my brother and like the kid of like the two richest guys in town. Oh, yeah, had pay like to play, right? Floors of yeah. empty buildings. And they had like, you know, thousands of dollars or, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars to bring in an equipment. Uh, those were the guys that started it out. Where I got really excited about Bitcoin, the guys that started doing the installs for us were all my dad's former construction workers, like electricians, guys that, you know, they're really great guys, but they just, you know, they didn't go to university, they didn't speak English, they were just like, just hustlers, people, yeah, hustlers, yeah. First, first time they installed this sort of setup for us, uh, it was, I don't know, I think the first one that, that we did with them was like, I don't know, 20 machines or something like that. And, you know, they're, they're doing the setup, like things normal, blah, blah, blah. Then they do the second setup. The second setup was like 30. And so the first setup was like, okay, cool, believe it is. What's this Bitcoin thing? Oh, interesting. Second time around, they're like, so what does this Bitcoin thing do? And like, oh, how, like, how, do, like, how do I do it? Like, can I, how do I try this? How would I learn about this? And we start sending them things. Third installation. So from one to the third one, probably like six months between the three. Third installation, the guy is like, I want to get paid in Bitcoin. Here's my address. <laughs> amazing. <laughs> and that was, I was like, oh man, this is going to be amazing. Wow. People, because that's how it happens. Yeah. Right? Like people see and they emulate, they learn. And so you, you think this is going to stay at the top, but it, it never does. It never does. People clue in very quickly. So to me, that's been really fascinating. So you're seeing more Venezuelans accepting it as a form of payment. Yes. I, you know. Full disclosure, I haven't been able to go back in two years. Sure. So I don't a lot of I don't blame you. conversations that I've had with a lot of my friends yeah. that are still there, I talk to everyone, all of them like daily. Um, and um, largely, it's, it's exciting. It's exciting to me because, you know, it, it's working as intended, right? Like that's the whole, that was the idea. Is yeah. that people could cross these borders. That's the whole uh, point. It's peer-to-peer -peer cash. 
you know, censorship yeah. resistant peer to peer. So that's where it's at now. Um, more and more people are using it. Uh, the political landscape, as far as where there be change or not, it's like a complete toss up. Like if I said, you know, in February, you know, our, our hopes were at 130% for change. Yeah. Venezuelan hopes right now are like negative 30. <laughs> uh, like no, no one is hopeful of any change. Government has done a really good job at, you know, making the opposition look like crap. Again, um, they, yeah, they just, they make it fall apart every time. So, yeah, right now it's, it's gridlock, really, politically. More, not even gridlock, it's like they are running the show, the bad guys. And no, no real chance of uh, nothing, fair elections anytime soon. Yeah. I remember you were, you had that podcast with uh, Alex Gladstein, Gladstein? Yeah, it was Peter. Yeah. What's, what's your thoughts, generally speaking, from like a global perspective? Like, where do you see Bitcoin in general heading currently? Um, that's a good question. I mean, my view right now is that there's there. So people discovered Bitcoin, right? Like largely people in emerging countries that that had a use for replacing their capital. Um, so I, I say joke half jokingly that. Uh, if you have to explain Bitcoin to someone, they probably don't need it. Uh, but at this point, well, that's a know, good way of saying it. Yeah, <laughs> ten years in, anyone that needs Bitcoin somewhat knows or has heard about it. Uh, people that don't need Bitcoin, so largely people in the OECD countries, like you have a hard time explaining it to them, right? Like when when your conversation to explaining to Bitcoin to somebody has to open up with, do you know what inflation is? <laughs> it's like. <laughs> That's gonna be a hard sell. <laughs> like, As I say, North America is not the good. Not it's probably the worst market for adoption. Yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah. Um, so what I have seen is so as, as at least from what I have witnessed as far as the evolution, uh, when people saw Bitcoin, they were like, "Okay, great, unstoppable money, incredible, incredible benefits over the U.S. dollar because the U.S. dollar gets censored. Mm -hmm. Amazing." I think right now we're in a somewhat of a in between phase where altcoins have not yet gotten shut down by the government. They're not altcoins, stable coins, mm -hmm. right? Because uh, the idea of stable coins, I mean, if, if, you, if this is what you do, if, if you sell me a stable coin as an unstoppable US dollar. Yeah. Oh boy. That is a great proposition. Sure. For anyone in that time or sure. any part of the world. That right? has a US buying power and doesn't fluctuate. What? Yeah. Are you kidding me? That's like the killer app, right? People want banking in U.S. Everywhere. dollars. Venezuela, that's, Turkey, that's Russia, everywhere. That's all they yeah. want. That's all they want. Like, if you ask these people, like, how could your life be improved? They will say, I would like a bank account <laughs> in a currency that is not a game. Mm. Right? That you would literally materially improve people's lives. Governments are reluctant to do that because they lose their rights on their seniorage. They lose their rights on their, uh, you know, exchange rate to the value of their currency. And well, they just lose exports. everything. Gone. So yeah. there, there's blocks around the world to have U.S. bank accounts around the world. So right now we're in this quasi, we're a very interesting period in that there's still this general perception that stable coins are okay. Like stable coins are not gonna hurt anyone and the governments are just gonna let them be. And as long as that's out there, I think stable coins will continue to gain interest. This is not taking away from Bitcoin. All I'm saying is if given the chance, and you're telling a 45-year-old person in Venezuela that just made $300,000, whether they want to place all of it in this volatile asset or some of it in an unstoppable version of a dollar and some of it in this asset, more and more people are going to choose to have some of it in dollars, a large part. Oh, I would almost suggest it because you don't want to have all of your stuff unless you really or want to. you want to have all your eggs in one basket. Right, and so right now there's this perception of rosy blue skies for stable coins yeah and as, me as long as that's there i think they're going to become more and more of a important tool in the crypto basket call it but i'm also skeptical to think that once governments start noticing what these stable coins are and what they're actually doing they're not going to be like nope <laughs> no, so well, it depends like you look at for example usdc right yeah you know, that one's fully regulated, audited with a peg to USD. Mm -hmm. 
So that's fully on the regulations of whatever SEC or any American government sanctions, right? Fine. USDT is a little bit, I don't even know the story of that. That's fine. <laughs> but they're now, the, you know, USDT or TUSD, yeah. like there's just a lot of them at a lot of places, yeah. right? But I think that, you know, and again, I don't know how this is going to play out. It may be, the, the way I understand a stable coin, I don't see why any government should oppose the stable coins being backed in the reserve by their own currency. Well, they're not opposed to that. I think what they're opposed to is something like a Libra or something like a, a DAI, where it's not actually directly correlated or audited to USD. Because with the, it, the problem is the labeling. When you look at USD, T or C, whatever, it's not technically a stable coin. It's technically a pegged coin. Right. Because it's pegged and audited like, likely one-to-one. -one, right. Right? So there's a bank account. There's a third-party, multi-party right. auditor. They right. go to the bank account like, oh, yeah, there's $100 million of U.S. money in bank ABC. Therefore, there's $100 million of this digital right. currency. Cool, right? That's not an issue because you're still hedging. You rely on the... You rely on the you you rely on USD to uh, to hedge it or peg it. The interesting thing is like Libra stuff or like the die stuff where it's like non pegging. I I would argue I would I would push back slightly on that yeah. and I would say that the biggest risk for the government yeah in my view at least and we had we had this chat where we were talking about Libra is that as a Venezuelan regime or as the Cuban regime or as India or as Iran or you name them um, the second I allow uh, people to start transacting in these dollar like tokens mm -hmm. and they become legal mm -hmm. when Venezuela uh, or Argentina like let's give the example of Argentina right now um, Argentina can say you know, whatever they want. Yeah. Right now. But they have a currency control. Yeah. When you say you have a currency control, and here's the problem, right? Like, in the past, when a country would institute a currency control, they would basically push back by saying, don't worry, this doesn't affect the average person. This only affects the people that travel. This only affects the people that import goods from abroad. Like, this won't affect the normal person. So don't worry. This is only for the rich. And if you see the rich getting mad on TV, now you know why. Mm. We're getting the money to you. And so that, that narrative sells. Because it's like, okay, that's, it makes sense. I don't travel. Makes sense. I don't have things from abroad. Makes sense. Those guys are really mad. Great. I must be getting more money then. And it's like, great. That, no, that, that's how they kind of taper down that, that concern. What's happening now is like as, when you introduce stable coins into things like Facebook is that now all of a sudden your day-to-day -day life actually becomes better because you start spending in dollars, mm -hmm. you start thinking about less things, and then all of a sudden you're like, why do I even have to take these bolivares? Like, why would I need them? They don't. They don't. So the government actually, next time they need to impose the capital controls, they're going to have to say, hey guys, don't worry, this only affects the people that travel and the people that bring imported goods and the people that are rich. And what's going to happen? The kid that was been, you know, the kid that's been playing Farmville is going to say, "No, it affects me too. I can't play Farmville, mm -hmm. and I can't, I can't play, for, I can't pay for my uh, storage month every day mm -hmm. for my app, mm -hmm. and my business shuts down now. My small marketing agency that I use to run media, social media for companies abroad, I can't do that without mm -hmm. Libra. So no, actually, I'm going to stop what I'm doing and go protest because you can't put that currency control. So it actually encroaches incredibly." on anyone that doesn't have a reserve currency as their own. People that have their reserve currencies as their own, they don't, they're not ever thinking of getting out of their currency. Yeah. Everyone else in the world is. And I think the biggest problem is, in fact, I'm actually surprised that the US, the, the government of the United States and, and the European Union, this, as far as I understand them, this benefits them. So long as they can keep control on those reserve, on that reserve always being held in their two coins, yeah. They can make Libra the proxy for the world. And we'll then, see what happens. Like, I don't... Yeah. I kind of approach it with... You got to look at it from, like, a strategy. You know, it's like... I always wonder why Facebook didn't just launch it. As opposed to them make this public announcement and go through this kind of roadshow. Like, I always ask that question, why? Right? 
something more to this than meets the eye. Probably. Um, it's a regulated, federated node system. Right. Meaning it's 100% regulated. Right. You know, the government can be all nodes if they want. Right. You know, they can say, hey, node A, well, blacklist all these things. Got right. You. Right. So it's not like, ooh, magic internet money that's like right. <laughs> censorship resistant. It's like, no. So for me, it's like, I think it's a net utility win for crypto in general. I think it's better than having a boulevard or Turkish lira or whatever, like horrible currencies. Mm -hmm. But I think there's much more to this story that we don't see. Yeah, for sure. And I always find it interesting where it's like, I don't see this as a threat, as you mentioned, because it's 100% regulated, like beyond regulated. So what are we not seeing here? That's the story. I'm not sure, man. You know, it's a circus show. You know, David Marcus goes on Senate and starts talking and yada, yada, yada. I'm like, okay. I, listen, like, you know, going back to the, my point, I was very excited when I first learned about Libra. Yeah. Um, because I think that what I saw when I, when people learn about Bitcoin and people learn about what, inflation is and what taxation by inflation is like it's a very hard concept to get your head around very hard really you think so i think so man especially if you don't have i mean listen we we've, we've just show people i showed them a dollar and i'm like hey two percent per year plus other inflationary models and products so let's say average three we take this dollar i rip i rip three-ish percentage this is your buying power the next year i rip that off and so forth and so forth and so it's like let's fast forward a decade you know, let's say two times 10, that's 20%, right? It's like, here you go. Here's 80 cents. Well, <laughs> yes, but I mean, the question, again, someone, that, that is great, but that, that person yeah. that you're explaining this to has to have a basic understanding of what, what money is, who, who makes it, why is it going down? Like, you know, when you say to somebody, hey, you're losing 3% of your purchasing power every year. Then you just show them supply and demand curves. I think for the most part, people, if you show them in like, specifically if you have like props and you're using like diagrams or whiteboarding, they can get it. It's like, hey guys, what happens? And you can use like analogies. It's like, okay, you know, we have 10 bananas and each banana is worth a dollar. Then what happens the next year when we have 20 bananas, each banana is worth 50 cents and so forth and so forth. I, you wish, know? I wish it was that simple. I guess what you have to go against in Venezuela is this narrative of, for example, so in Venezuela, you'll get the dollar. There's there's a um, the government rate for the dollar. Yeah. And then the government obviously never updates the rate. The rate is a complete sham. And then the black market rate emerges, right? Which those who know about economics, you're like, well, is, is that the only rate in which you can trade freely? Yes. Well, then, then that's the rate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, uh, so then you start referring referencing the dollar by that rate, right? And that rate moves very fast, very quickly. Mm -hmm. So then you tell someone that is, let's just say, not on your camp as far as seeing eye to eye and things. And you say to them, hey, are you looking at the dollar skyrocket? Like, are, have you, are you seeing this? And then the, the response you'll get will be, yes, it is the corporates who are basically withholding all of their dollars from the supply because they want to shoot the price up to make the government look bad. Mm -hmm. That's the ignorance you're up against. Um, and 20 years in, millions of deaths and exiles and hundreds if not thousands of killed politicians later, you still get a lot of that. And like, how do you get through those people? Like the real, the, the, some of these people will only get there themselves after they hit rock bottom themselves. I don't think so you can get through people for the most part. I think changing human behavior so two things changing human behavior and changing the way someone views the world is almost impossible you know there's different lines of thoughts out there do we have free will are we hard-coded to behave a certain way i think the answer is somewhere in between right genetics epigenetics environment you know sure you know if i was living in venezuela and i was run you know like if i was deep in it knowing me like I'm like straight gangster <laughs> Like, if these motherfuckers rolling up with me, like, straight up, I'll roll back. Right. Like, I don't give a fuck. Right. It's me or you. It's going to be you. 
Right. Like, I don't give a shit. You know, because I'm in that environment. No, that's, like, that's how mean. I got to fucking behave. I'm going to be like, oh, please take my stuff. No, like, no, but, motherfucker. I'm going to go war with you. Well, that's that's pretty much it. But then it gets to. Yes, that's that's your initial reaction. Like that, my initial reaction to these guys was like, fuck these guys. Mm-hmm. You know what? <laughs> we can do this suit. Right. Mm-hmm. And like, let's go toe to toe. Um there is, it's hard for me to explain and it's hard for me to say, and a lot of it is, is, is just, just politics being politics, right? Like, um, there were a lot of unkept promises before Chavez. There was a lot of, um, and a lot of times it's not even about what you do, it's about yeah. what you're saying, right? So it's very hard to fight against somebody, somebody for example, one thing Chavez had is just had a magnificent branding. Like the way he, he, like his, his narrative, his stories, how he basically weaved everything together. Uh, it just, it was great marketing. Mm-hmm. Like he, he would be, you know, he's, he announced projects in the billions of dollars in budgets that are still in plan, in the plan phase today. And people don't give him shit for that. You know, people still don't give him a little shit. Like people in Venezuela, it, it, what, what I find surprising mm-hmm is that in today's Venezuela, and, and I still, I, I say this, I can't answer this to you. Mm-hmm. I don't know why. I, I, I don't know why in today's Venezuela, there, there's just no more, not, not enough political will to like shut the whole thing down and change the government. Uh, context matters, man. Like it matters the history of the country. It matters culture. It matters circumstances like look what happened in hong kong man they went fucking gung-ho man million people on the street and to the best of my uh, knowledge the bill has been shut down we'll see right right i don't know but they went balls to the wall um i got you know i've gone to cuba a lot and it's uh, they call it communist but i don't know if that's your definition of communism i don't know what the f- that's like it's not even dictated. I don't even know what it is. It's like weirdest system I've ever seen. Um, and there's still people there screaming, hey, government, yay, you know, the old uh, Castro regime. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm like, what the fuck has he done for you? Mm-hmm. I'm like, am I living in a fucking twilight zone? So it goes into like a devil A devil known is, a, is better than a devil unknown. It's familiar. You have cognitive dissonance, right? And you have all these like social pressures build up where it's like, meh. Well, and that's, I mean, to me, the, the, you know, A, that's, a, that's a, I, I get that. And I think very similarly, and that's a hard pill to swallow uh, many times, especially because it's, it's, it's not a hard pill to swallow until it happens to you. Yeah. Right? Like, I'm totally fine talking about Cuba and being like, oh, yeah, no, let the ones who want to stay, stay. Like, and let the ones who want to leave, leave. That sounds yeah. like a great setup, right? Except... When you're the one that wants to leave, but your family is the one that wants to stay. Stay, yeah. Uh, and that happens. Like, it, it actually, like, I get, I get emotional about this shit because um, you hear it all the time. And, like, it doesn't matter. Um, it doesn't fucking matter how well you're doing. Mm-hmm. Right? Like, because you're always... Fuck. It's gonna look bullshit here. Yeah. Um, it doesn't matter how well you're doing. Right? Because, like... You can you can feel good about that shit every day, but like every day you're gonna open up the newspaper and you're you gonna see, see shit, yeah. really bad shit that's happening to your people. Mm-hmm. Like you have shit, you have people that die and you can't go see. You know, like you have people that like have shit that goes out and you can't, you're not there, mm-hmm. right? Like, <laughs> bullshit. Um, like I've missed birthdays. Like I miss you know I miss everything. Um, <laughs> bullshit. Um, it all goes back to fucking corrupt politicians. Yeah, man. Like the hardest part for me, which I actually has never, never actually been on record, is like my my grand my daughter is named after my grandmother, who's ninety fucking eight. Wow. And she's yeah. still alive. Wow. In Venezuela, but they haven't met, uh, and I don't know if they will. And, and I mean, fuck, fuck this stop fucking crying. That's um, good, man. I, I don't know if they will. Yeah. Right. And like that's fucking frustrating. Right, like the fact that I can't do anything about that um, kills me, like fucking kills me. Um, and like, fuck, she, my grandma, I can't be mad at her. She couldn't have fucking predicted this. I can't be mad at my fucking parents. They sent me out. They did their best. I'm here. My daughter's safe. 
Mm. You know, I can't blame my wife because she's scared shitless of going. <laughs> right? Like, who do you blame? You know? I don't think so. This is a blame game. No, no, it's not. It's not. But eventually you're frustrated. And when you're frustrated, all you want to do is fix it. Of course. Right? That's how I have work. Right? Every time I I come across something, I'm like, okay, great. This is how you're feeling. Perfect. Separate yourself from the emotion. How do you fix it? What are the steps to fix it? What if you can't? It's also the definition of fixing. You know, people try to fix things as like, let me fix Venezuela or any country as a whole. You can't. Man, I'd rather fix one person if I can. Or and I, even, I don't like the word fix or assist help. or yeah. help. One person. Yeah. You never know where that. You never know where that one person will end up or what he or she does. Right. You know. Well, and that's the thing, right? Like, so many people played a role in who I am today. So many people. Mm -hmm. People like I grew up my whole life in Venezuela. Like the people that made me who I am today largely are nowhere to be seen mm -hmm. for me nearby. Like I can't, I can't go up and say thank you, right? Like it doesn't happen. And uh, a lot of those people that did a lot of things for me, like, they can't leave. They're still there. They, like I can't help them. Does right? money help them? No. Yeah. I can, I can, so if, I'll give you a specific point i'll give you i'll give you the case of like my nana the girl who i, I grew up with her mm. she wants to be close to her family too doesn't matter how where and what conditions they're in like the best thing i can offer to her i, I can say to her hey i'll fly you over you can work with me you'll earn dollars mm. like you'll be free but she's the way she sees it she's just going to be in a parrot cage with a bunch of dollars yeah so you you can't help a lot of people the way you want to it's you really can't. And that's the biggest piece is like, it's the human piece like that you don't talk about, right? Like every, and I see this, you, you can, you, you feel it in every immigrant. Mm -hmm. They're not complete. And there, it's that chip that makes you overbuilt almost. And that, and you build something great for your kids. And that's great. And then someday your kids have to leave and they have, they're feeling complete and they'll overbuild as well. You know? So I feel like, uh, you know, a, a lot, uh, you know, me here, like I, I essentially, that's, that's my narrative now. It's like, I never want my daughter to go through what I have to go through. Right. And I'll make sure that I'll bear hell a fucking Citadel if I can, you know, <laughs> and I'll fucking Fuck leave her with 6.15 Bitcoin. And like, that'll yeah. be it. Um, I, I would love that world or I would love that. But, you know, and, and Part of it too, sometimes I'm like, the way I get out of this shit, the way I get out of this funk is like, fuck man, maybe that's life. You know what? Like, maybe that's, maybe that is life is figuring out how you're going to fix it and, and having to go through all these things. And this is this constant cycle of that's Buddhist saying, life is suffering, but people view suffering as a negative connotation. Um, it's uh, how you perceive it. So it's like, maybe, maybe that's it. Maybe, maybe, maybe my job is to have this chip and to build things around Bitcoin because maybe that'll lead to some yeah. other people to get another fucking massive moment. And you ever read uh, Viktor Frankl's book, Man's Search for Meaning? No. Oh God. No, I have not. I'll take a read. I want I want to read the three body problem or the third uh, third body problem or the three body problem. I don't know that book. Which it's like a it's like a really dark book about like statistics and like. Read Viktor Frankl's book. I will. I will. It's epic. Yeah, I'll read it. But. Uh, but yeah, man. I mean, we've gone, we've, we've gone through the, through all of the Venezuelas and back. But uh, yeah, it's uh, this it never ends. We can talk about this shit all day. <laughs> there is a bright side, you know. You're here. Oh, building. Absolutely. Your daughter has a bit brighter future. Absolutely. Your wife has a brighter future. No, oh, of course. I, I. And the long tail, you can help more people that way. I, I say that all the time. If like, your house isn't built, how are you going to help build other people's houses? That's that's. You know, Shannon asked me this uh, when I spoke to her, uh, speaking of crypto. Uh, that was like her uh, her last question or something like that. I think she was like, you know, is it, it was leaving the right decision? And um, and my answer was that. It was like, I, I, if I hadn't left, I obviously wouldn't be here with you today. Yeah. Um, I can't say what it would have been like. But what I do love about what I'm doing here now is that we know for a fact that hundreds of people are using our service in Latin American countries mm -hmm. like Venezuela, places like Argentina, places like Venezuela. I fucking get goosebumps whenever I 
I when we got our first like few loan applications from Venezuela, it was like I was like, is this happening? Maybe people like, are for like uh, whoever's listening to this right now, maybe you can explain to them how that service works with Ledin. Yeah, sure. So what we do is we built two products. Uh, essentially, Ledin, what we built is a is a is a suite of services that help people hold Bitcoin for longer or save in Bitcoin. I think a lot of people talk about you know spending in Bitcoin. There's not enough conversation about saving. Mm. Bitcoin. Bitcoin is incredible savings technology. Like people don't understand. It's not about getting rich quick. It's about getting poor slow. <laughs> <laughs> That's your new tagline. <laughs> so. It's, uh, you know, keeping Bitcoin allows you to benefit from the debasing of every other currency, right? So that is really, to me, I see it as savings, uh, in essence. Uh, so where we saw that a lot of people uh, had a hard time was just keeping the Bitcoin. Like Bitcoin is, is your highest and most liquid asset in a lot of markets. So by virtue of that, whenever you have a little crunch, it's the first one through the block, through the chopping block, because there's the best one, the mm -hmm. only one you can sell. What we do is... For people that have worked very hard to earn a little bit of Bitcoin and they don't want to sell it because they have very high expectations of the future price, they can place that Bitcoin as collateral and take a dollar loan. And the way that works is if your Bitcoin keeps rising in price, that's all yours to keep. Uh, same and that's Bitcoin. fiat you get. And you get fiat. USD. Yeah, you get dollars, US dollars or Canadian or CAD, dollars. Yeah. yeah. Um, and essentially, you have your loan commitment in dollars. You can use your dollars. So if I'm in Venezuela right now or anywhere in Latin or Mexico, I know you guys are working yeah. there too. Yeah. It's like... I log in. Yep. I can put up my Bitcoin. Yep. Whatever collateral, three to one. Yep. Let's say I put a thousand bucks of Bitcoin. That means I can take three hundred dollars of CAD or USD. Yeah. Five hundred. We do fifty percent. Oh, fifty yeah, percent. Yeah. Okay. So I take fifty percent. So I take five hundred bucks. That goes directly to my bank account in Mexico. Yes. yes. Where do you want? So, so some any people, bank account that I own. Yes. It has ah, to be a your name. It can be in any country. Yeah, but I, yeah, I control it. Yeah. And yeah. some people we've had some clients that actually don't have USD accounts in Venezuela. Precisely. Yeah. And they want to receive it. The rails they want to use to get the funds is Bitcoin, even though the loan is in dollars. But okay. So they're putting up Bitcoin to get Bitcoin. Correct. They're, they're putting up Bitcoin to get dollars, but the way they can get those dollars the easiest. It's kind of like fucking what Dai was doing with like ETH <laughs> going long, going long on Bitcoin. Well, something <laughs> similar. Exactly. So in essence, at, on, on first glance, you can see it as you're going super long. But yeah. what these guys are doing is they're converting the Bitcoin once it hits their wallet again. And to they're USD. going, yeah, yeah, they're yeah, going yeah. back to their local account. It makes sense. Yeah. And it makes a lot of sense. So, um, you know, we started, and so a lot of people are demanding stable coins. So they're paying dough back in Bitcoin since they can't send. Uh, so they're they're putting in Bitcoin. Yes. Sending them Bitcoin. Yes. Then for them to pay back the loan, they're paying back in Bitcoin. Correct. Uh, yes. Yes. Um, and so what this has done is that it helps people. So for example, I had a guy. I'll give you. I can't really give you the exact name, but like I've had so many people reach out and be yeah. like. This is amazing. I wanted to buy a, another mining computer, but I didn't want to sell my Bitcoin. Now I'm going to get a loan and I just bought it. Yeah. And it's amazing. Another guy was like, I really wanted to start a music festival, a music festival of all things. Hmm. Like, I never expected that answer. But he said, with my $5,000 whatever loan, I started work on my first music festival. Like, they're just amazing. coming out. This is incredible. Like, I want to share this news with you guys. And we're excited like these people are again in mexico and get Venezuela, that guy on video Argentina. bro the testimony well, i will they're they're actually getting interviewed so we had Good. uh two two uh, media publications i'll share the articles yeah. when they come out but they're actually interviewing a lot of our clients Good. Uh, because they're excited about some of these stories um it's been amazing like it, honestly it's and it was great because in canada you know it's been amazing to see the difference of reactions when you present the product in these two different markets. Because in Canada, people can, get, you know, not everyone, but most, like a lot of people can get a mortgage for like 3%, 2%. Now yeah. they're going into like negatives. <laughs> Banks are now soon gonna pay you to freaking- They're gonna pay you. Take out a mortgage. But let's keep that aside. Oh. And let's say OECD countries have relatively great access to credit. Yeah. I wanna use my Bitcoin for a mortgage on commercial real estate. Well, you can with us. Well, with these guys, yeah. essentially in Venezuela, and when, what you're seeing is, you know, when you're in Canada and you're saying, okay, here's a, you know, the option for a Bitcoin back loan. This is what you use. This is what it's good for. This is how it works. And it's great. And it's amazing. And people use it. Uh, but it's not like, a, oh, my God, you solved every problem, like blah, 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 because people have relatively good access to mm -hmm. debt. So they compare us to say, you know, a line of credit or a credit card or things like. Because yeah, your interest rate is pretty cheap. Like, is a we pay 1% a month. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and we have a 2% admin fee, uh, okay. but a 1% per month on, and charge daily. So the day you pay back, that's the day oh, you cool. pay to. Uh, 
So in, in Mexico, to give you some context, how much, what do you think the interest rate is in Mexico for a mortgage? Fuck, at least 14%. That's spot on. Yeah. So 14% for a mortgage in Mexico. And anyone that's applied for credit outside of the OECD countries knows that it's not always about what's the headline. Of it's course like not. Nobody People qualifies. forget, man, like uh, 90, 1989, 91, 92, 93, it was 19.5. Yeah. In Canada. Yeah. You know, my dad actually ended up uh, once paid 88% for a commercial loan in Venezuela. How long? Uh, this was, I think this was in like late eighties. Oh, 88%. Yeah. Well, th this is, this is rates in Venezuela, right? So in Mexico, when we, when we presented our products, That's crazy. people were like, you know, I've been at conferences here in Canada and I've, you know, I've been on the booth and presented our stuff and people were like, oh wow. The Mexico is your prime target, man. Dude. So we knew that from, we, we've been working on Mexico for a long yeah. time. Yeah. Um, so we got to Mexico. And I got to hook up on my boys in Guadalajara. Oh, let's do it, yeah. man. I'm actually going to Mexico in November. Cool. Um, so I, we show up in Mexico. We start presenting a product. And people are like coming in like with these shock faces, right? They're like, oh, my God. What? What? Really? And we're like, yeah. Like, right. I'm like a little bit like I, I was like, I didn't know if they were like, you know, what they were sticker shocked or what. And then the guys were like coming at me and being like, seriously, like, what's the catch? Yeah. And I was like, what do you mean? It's like 1% a month for dollar debt. Yeah. What, what, no one's going to qualify. Like, why do I need to qualify? Like, nothing, bro. All you need is Bitcoin. Yeah, you got collateral. It's there. And they're like, and what? And I'm like, no, that's it. It's like, Bitcoin, you give me your bank account, I'll send you the money. He's like, yeah. ah, he's like, no. And I was like, no, it's like for 1% a month. And I was like, yeah, we have a 2% admin fee. So the whole thing, if yeah. you keep it for a whole year, is 14%. He was like, that's amazing. Like, it was just like, everybody was like, that's incredible. That's incredible. That's incredible. Thank you guys. Like, I'm, I can't believe you're bringing this price debt. Like, how are you doing this? Yeah, yeah. And we're like, well, it's, we've raised funds from Canadian investors mm -hmm. and our job is essentially to treat a Bitcoin back loan from Canada as the same, like, I have the same collateral. Mm -hmm. I issue the same money. Why am I going to charge them a different money? Exactly. Right? Like, and I think that's the biggest thing about what excites me the most about what we do is that Bitcoin now is a fully globally liquid asset. And this is going to change materially. We haven't really seen the tip of the iceberg on this. Like in Venice, like in countries like Argentina, you got $100,000 10 years ago. You would probably put it in like a house mm -hmm. or a car mm -hmm. or this. Now you get $100,000, where are you going to put it? All in Argentina, you're not going to put a little bit into Bitcoin? You're going to put it outside of Argentina. And so I think that this, this is going to be a big impact. And, and we love the fact that our product is able to essentially help people hold Bitcoin when they want to. Um, and that, that's essentially it. So in Venezuela, like, I'm very happy. It's, it's a market that we're, we're very focused on. Mexico, Argentina, actually, everything that's happening there is opening a lot of doors. We're getting a lot of applications good. from there. Good, good. Um, Mexico is actually growing, sadly. Uh, again, I say sadly because when we have a growing Bitcoin market, usually something's going badly <laughs> somewhere else. Um, but uh, essentially, they're great markets. And I think that people need this kind of service to be able to see the true benefit of holding Bitcoin long term. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's, that's in a nutshell. Um, well, I'm very excited about that. going back to where we're from, essentially. I love it, man. Well, Mauricio, thank you for sharing your story. If you had one message to tell people, what would that be? Oh, man, don't fight with your family. <laughs> uh, or at least try it's not to worth fix it, it at the end of the day. It's yeah. not worth it. Yeah. Just try to fix it. Yeah. Uh, try to keep them close. Uh, I always have a saying with like some family members, like, I love you, but I don't respect you. They're two different things. You know what I mean? I love you, but I won't, you know. No, and I, and I mean, not, not obviously that doesn't, it's not a cookie cutter. I, sure. I don't think that applies, but I think that um, there's, there, you know, people get too caught up uh, with, uh, you don't know what you got until you lose it. And, and I think that. Grass is greener on the other side, yeah, right? You I, take everything for granted. Yeah, I, I read a, an article about, uh, I, I read an article the other day about essentially what happens to a man when they lose their father, like mm. what the life changes that you go through and like the fear of God that like strikes you. And it's, I've been really blessed, I think, because I've had a very supportive. Seems like your father was a good father. He's amazing. Yeah. Oh man, I love the guy to death. He's, he's still my boy. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, 
you're tempted always to fight and find things to fight about with your family and you're always trying to think what you're doing better and blah 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 and how things aren't fair or this or that but all that stuff is going to go away one day mm. um sometimes maybe not in your terms uh and so it's just always good to you know just uh make sure that i return the favor to all the ones that helped you and a lot of stuff's like once you have a kid you realize like man you can hate your parents but fuck yeah. did they work for you yeah, <laughs> you know uh so yeah i just uh you know, this whole having to leave my my whole family has made me very cognizant and hyper aware of what's who's close and who's not, right? So, um, yeah, just keep... Oh, thank you. I appreciate yeah. that. If people want to get in contact with you, follow what Ledin's doing, best resources? Uh, Twitter, I would say, is probably the best place to find us. Uh, at HODL with Ledin is our handle for, for Ledin and myself. I'm at Cryptonomista, at Cryptonomista. So it's uh, Cryptonomist with an A at the end. So, yeah reach me out anywhere there all right guys go follow mauricio go check out london and i'll see you guys soon peace